Good afternoon and welcome to The Takeout. Today we have episode 122, Finding Your Foundation and Fueling Your Growth. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome into The Takeout. Happy Education Friday to you and glad to see you guys in here, here to learn, here to talk about how we consume the kinds of inspirational information that are going to help us to digitize and embroider with the kind of styles we want that help us to learn. And uh, today I'll be taking a little bit more personal tack to this. I'm going to talk about my own process of learning. You guys have heard me talk about kind of the origin story of how I got where I am and how I became a digitizer, but I'm going to talk a little bit more about it and in more detail about kind of that early period of time where I was trying to get my feet under me and understand a little bit more about embroidery. Uh, this is actually pursuant to a question from one of the viewers, somebody who actually jumped in and asked directly. I didn't ask for their permission to use their name, so I'm going to talk about their question, but I'm not going to say who it is. If you're out there in the comments, you can always identify yourself if you like. But we're going to talk about what it's like when you have a vision for what you want to create. You feel like you're on your way, but you're not quite there yet. And what do you do to get there? And I'll specifically talk about what I did to get where I wanted to get with embroidery. I'll say this. Number one, uh, I think that I'm never quite where I want to be. I still learn things consistently, and I'm still going through this process right now. As I think most of us are who've been in the industry for a while who still have a love for it. I am consistently looking for uh, inspiration and looking for different ways to use embroidery, to use stitches, to uh, communicate, to show, to make marks in a way that is meaningful and interesting and novel. If you're in business, you're also looking for things that are going to drive novelty, that are going to make impressive looks and textures and enable you to interpret different kinds of art better. But overall, I think that this learning process, this inspirational process, it doesn't just stop at some point. You don't become a master and you know wash your hands of the thing. I think honestly, you go through waves of looking for inspiration, but if we take care to think about how we feed ourselves and how we kind of feed into that hopper that is our minds, that kind of unconscious ability to process things, uh, the kinds of information and the kinds of inspiration that are going to help us get where we want to go, that we can create something through kind of the process of you know macerating all this stuff and getting down to the juice, extracting what all these things can show us, what they can teach us, so that we can create something with focus that is what we want to create that we're interested in. So I'm going to talk about that today, and I will give you some examples. There is a links list. We'll have some stuff to share as we go along, but this should be kind of a fun, more personal version of this thing. We're going to talk not just about some of the technical high points, but I'm going to talk to you about how I did it, uh, how I went about my process, especially because as a digitizer, I was very much self-taught. I mean, I have been to uh, one class in my life, <laughs> which is not great since I'm somebody who teaches all these classes. But what I'm going to tell you is the reason why I, I do teach is because I went to a class. And by the time I went to that class, the one uh, the one time I ever went to do an actual formal class, um, one of the pieces that I showed to the person teaching the class, he took one of my pieces and the analysis that I had done, uh, photocopied it and then shared it with everybody. By the time I was I was uh, somewhere where someone could teach me, I had already gone through all the pitfalls and the fighting and the uh, beating your head against the wall that it took for me to get to a point that I could digitize pretty well. And if I can stop you guys from having to do that stuff, hopefully I can give some folks a leg up who are in that kind of beginner stage or who are trying to do something new and haven't gotten there yet. If I can help you to not beat your head against the wall and not suffer, then that's why I do direct education. But I'm going to talk to you about the reality of what it took for me to kind of get my hands around or my head around the uh, the kind of object of what it means to digitize and interpret for embroidery. Uh, first, I'm going to say hello to some folks who are here, who are listening in. I always like to say hi and interact. Uh, if you don't love that stuff, catch it on the stream after the fact. Do replay squad and you can fast forward through it. But if you're here live, you, gotta, you guys got to know I love the interaction with you and I'm glad to answer questions, talk to you and involve you in the process. Love to hear more about how you learned to digitize if you're out there and you're digitizing. Also, so let's go on with the people who are saying hi. Cindy King out of Texas. Good afternoon, Cindy. Happy to have you in. Uh, Jeff and Adam. So Jeff Fuller and Adam Fuller uh, of Fuller Embroidery Works and BJHats.com, respectively. So longtime listeners and friends of the show. Uh, uh, clothing's Clothings. Don't know who you are. Love the uh, <laughs> love the emojis and love the name. Joe Rita says, hello, Eric and everyone else. Hello, Joe Rita. Always doing great work. Ramona says, woo woo, love to hear foundation stories. Yeah, we will get into it though. Like I said, I'll try not to recount just everything about me becoming a digitizer, but we'll we'll talk about a little bit about that process. Frank Dunn out from the UK, always sharing good information. Thank you, Frank, for uh, being here and good evening to you, sir. 
Jorita is still recovering from a whole bout of COVID. Oh, I hope you get to feeling better, Jorita. Everybody who is out there suffering, we are pulling for you. Yosta is in from Sweden. Hi, Yosta. Uh, Sally is in. Good evening. Adelina is here and saying hello. Uh, Tina says hello from Tennessee. Looking forward to seeing you in Fort Worth. Awesome. I will be out in Fort Worth soon. So yeah, a couple, couple months ahead. Not quite a couple months. Uh, we will be doing the Impressions Expo show. So if you're going to come see me out there, I uh, believe I only got two things on the schedule. They kind of changed things up on me, and I just got a new schedule. So uh, patch class coming uh, coming in hot for the long term. That's the big one that comes before the show. And then it looks like I'm still doing my editing for non-digitizers class. We will see. And John coming out. Uh, hi from Atlanta. Thanks for doing this. Absolutely, John. Happy to do so. Uh, and if you don't mind me identifying you, then John, John sent in his question. And I'm actually going to go ahead and read out uh, the question that started all this. And this is what John said. Um, do you have any tips or resources for someone whose vision for what they want to do with digitizing is greater than their skill? And I think that's all of us when we start, by the way. Um, and that's that's what he's kind of summing up. And to sum up the rest of his kind of questions on this one, it's like, I think the main trouble is how to break down an image in the right way. Uh, also knowing how you would choose one stitch over another stitch and trying to get past that point where maybe you can make some decent designs, uh, but you want to get something that's more into the interpretation. So we're going to talk about that. I'm certainly going to talk about the rest of how we get there in the first place. So don't get me wrong. I think part of the thing I have to make sure to do while I have everybody here and there may be people of multiple skill levels is just make it clear that there is a certain amount of, of technical hurdles that we're going to start out with and kind of outline what I think everybody needs to know in general. But we're going to get into more of what we do in interpretation as well. But I'm going to cover all of that. How, what do we need to be digitized? I think that's really the primary question. But what I really liked about what he said here and what he's asking is that this is really kind of the issue that we come across. And a lot of us are there. Um, we've seen some embroidery and we we know kind of what we want or we have a desire to do stuff. John's case is patches. For a lot of us, it might be something else. Who knows what it is that you want to do, but you know what you want to do in embroidery. You have a concept in your mind. But the skill you have, or at least your feeling about what you're doing, your uh, confidence in what you're doing is, is not quite there yet, or you're not quite sure of the techniques to use. Um, I don't want to say this to everybody, but th that does mean we're going to be in for some trial and error. You guys have known that I always say trial and error is inevitable. I think it absolutely is inevitable, but it's not something that should be seen as a negative. I think when I've said before that trial and error in the process is inevitable, what I want everybody to know is though it is inevitable, that shouldn't be seen as I'm being punished by trial and error. The process of discovery should be exciting for us and we should give ourselves the space to do that process and to understand that we are going to make mistakes, if you want to call them mistakes. Uh, we're going to go through learning processes that require us to sometimes ruin some garments, sometimes uh, make something that isn't what we want to make. The problem is that if we get into this kind of negative attitude toward it, we're going to kind of punish ourselves. We shouldn't expect that everything we put out is good, and we should expect that everything's a learning process. Any result from which you can get meaningful data is a positive result in the process of learning. It's hard when you're doing things commercially because you can be, uh, like I was, kind of stuck with this process of, I have to sell things. I have to sell garments to people with embroidery that's good enough for them to pick up and be happy with, if I'm digitizing on my own, and especially if I've started entirely on my own, that may be difficult for me. It might be something that's hard for me to get a hold of, for me to get a grasp on, but I still have to keep the needles moving, and get things out the door. So before I go too far with it, I just want to make sure that you guys kind of hear this. Uh, this is just the reality. It is okay when you start, and in fact, sometimes desirable for you to hire it out. I know I've said this before on the show. I just want to make sure it's clear. When I was first digitizing, I wasn't doing all of the digitizing from moment one and all of the old files we had. It's not like I had to clear everything out from the existing company that I lived in. I didn't go to my department and dump all of the converted tapes and files out of our drives and out of the folders, truthfully, that they were in and dump those and start from scratch. We hired some th certain things out, certain complicated things during the first couple of months were certainly hired out. Now I was in full tilt production within three months, not everybody's gonna get there. I did a lot of, and I mean quite literally 15 to 20 hour days. I did a lot of sleeping you know, in my car, under my desk, running home, catching a nap and coming back because I was working after hours to learn digitizing on my own. It's not a normal thing to expect and it's not something I want everybody to do. So you may or may not be up to speed with commercial digitizing for multi-head machines for thousands of pieces within a couple months. You might not. Some people, especially back in the day, they used to tell people you weren't good for a year. I don't think that's true. People have different propensities for this stuff, but it's okay to hire it out at first. 
Because the great thing is, if we get a digitizer who is good, if we get somebody who really knows their stuff and technically has their chops, they know their technical foundations. And we're going to talk about that again in a second. So they know how to deal with distortion. They know how to deal with materials. They know what they're doing and they make decent files. The great thing is we, we want to learn from good examples. This is one of the best ways that we can learn embroidery and digitizing is by running embroidery, running files, being present for those on the machine and running good example files. We're going to talk about that. And honestly, if you guys have heard before, uh, you've been anywhere around me talking about this before. I also say analyzing existing designs. That's a huge part of what we're going to want to do to get ourselves on board with digitizing, especially if we're in the dark, if we don't have direct education to lean on. Analyzing existing designs is one of the best things we can do. We can learn to measure things like density. We can understand what stitch angles are. We can learn our basic stitch types and we can see how they're put together in sequence. So analyzing existing designs is huge. So what better way than to partner up with a digitizer who does do what we want to do, hire it out, and then analyze the way that they put things together. Break down the sequence that it runs in, how deep all the overlaps are between elements, what stitches they chose for certain elements in the design, and watch it run on the machine, on the real materials, so that we can understand the interaction between needle, thread, stabilizer, and file. Once we do that, we get we can kind of grok this. We can understand it, as the Icelanders said back in the day when I traveled to Iceland, below our lower jaws. We can get a direct experience of how this is working on the machine, and we'll understand those interactions very easily, or at least uh, in, a, in, like I said, a very material, physical way. We can watch things happen, and we can correlate that to the file because we've replayed the file, analyzed it, measured it in our software, and looked at that. So it's totally fine for you to hire things out. The first thing I find when people are, are digitizing stuff, especially sometimes people who are a uh, skilled in design feel like they're going to pick up digitizing immediately because you can draw vector. And the truth is there's so much material that you have to understand. And I mean, literal material, fabrics, threads, the tension on the machine, the way that stabilizer reacts and pull and push compensation, the, the kind of uh, things that are unique to driving a needle thousands of times through a piece of fabric. Uh, there's so much of that material execution to understand and learn that the design is only a portion of it. And I think until you get a grasp for the other stuff, the other the other portion of it, the material realities of embroidery, it can be hard uh, to get more of this together. So what I'm going to say is, don't feel bad about this. Don't feel bad about hiring it out or don't feel bad about learning from other people's examples. In fact, one of the other things we can do, find a really great digitizer who gives out free example designs and analyze the heck out of them. Hey, give them business, hire them for something, support them if you're doing it right. But at the same time, look at their designs. Heck, look at some of the better stock design companies. Some of the ones that are made for the home market may be a little inefficient, though they still may have some very artistic interpretations. Buy some stock designs and tear those down too. You see a stock design that does a kind of shading that you love, buy the stock design, watch it run in sequence, analyze each element of the embroidery, how dense a fill is, what kind of patterns they are, what kind of stitch angles there are, how things are layered together, how things are, are uh, overlapped to see how deep the overlaps are, what kinds of stitch types are used for what kinds of elements, and replicate them to your best ability. It's okay to do that. You don't want to just outright steal people's techniques and say they're your techniques. That's not what you want to do. But you are going to learn from other people's example. And a lot of the basic techniques that we have in embroidery have been around forever. Back to the world of, of hand embroidery, back to old needlework, potentially medieval needlework has been the same stuff. So we're going to learn a lot of the same stuff, but you may learn more about it in the concept of digitizing if you learn from digitized files and if you also combine it with some of the other education we're going to talk about in a second here when we understand what tools and stitch types are available in our software and then we look at analyzed designs and existing embroideries and see where those overlap how we can create these stitches and then we test and play and learn we have a chance to bring ourselves to somewhere better. Certainly we can start with imitation. Imitation is the first way we get things done. We learn from a direct example and we imitate that example. And if we can create something the same as the example we saw, now we understand how it's put together. Then we remix, we learn by using the techniques from that imitation in order to create something new and to develop our new techniques.
So I know that seems like a lot. First thing I'm going to do real quick, we talked about resources. I'm going to go ahead and drop this here for you real quick. We do have a links list today, and I'm going to drop this in the comments for everybody who is here live and who's coming up once it's something clickable, go check it out in the comments. I will drop that in on all the channels. Uh, this is the links list that we have available today. I'm gonna go ahead and share my second screen so I can show you some of the fun stuff that is on the links list. But we do have some uh, stuff to add to the pot today for you guys to check out. So if you haven't checked that out yet, uh, grab that link on screen, grab it from the comments, and you'll be able to check that out at your leisure. However, we're gonna go ahead and drop the banner out. We'll take a look at some of the stuff that is on the links list today. We have a few things that are interesting. First things, I made a small kind of playlist of existing take up episodes that help you with these, uh, with the kind of problems that we talked about that John talked about. First one, developing an eye for machine embroidery is about interpreting art into embroidery. So the qualities of real like objects, it's how we break things down. A lot of the way that we break things down into objects for embroidery has to do with understanding the quality of stitches, like what does a satin stitch look like? What can it be used for? What does it work for as far as the width of an element? We can talk more about that in a second. And then saying, all right, what does that apply to? Things that are cylindrical, things like arms, fingers, hands, uh, hydraulic rams on, on a material of the side wall of a tire on a car. These things work very well with satin stitches at certain sizes. We have to work at scale, of course. And this is about understanding how that comes about. We look at real objects and structures and we break them up using stitch types and textures that make sense for that particular object in real life if we're trying to intimate that texture or that shape. So that episode 22 has a bit of that stuff in it. We will still touch on some of that today, but I have an hour today and, in and I'm going to hand you four plus hours of content you can listen to whenever you want. Uh, second one here, it's stitch types and motifs in machine embroidery. This is me just talking about the basic stitch types, the big four, right? Uh, straight stitch and manual stitch sometimes are one stitch type, but I go manual and straight stitch. We have our satin stitch, we have our fill stitch. Those are our real big ones. So it's like straight or manual, straighter running stitch, uh, fill stitch, st satin stitch. What do we use those for? What measurements make sense in an object? Usually it's about the width or the area of coverage of an object. And those are the basic rules of thumb. And the thing I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about that in a second, that these are rules of thumb, that we learn to fill areas with stitches and it doesn't mean that there's a right or wrong. We'll talk about that. But that's in episode 36. Episode 56, design deconstruction is where we get a little further into how to break a design apart. So how do I make designs on how to render particular designs? And in this case, I actually showed some designs that I've done and I walked you through the process a little more uh, directly. After that, we've got episode 119, really recent one where I talk about examining machine embroidery stitches in samples. So I talk about looking at what stitches are there and uh, what we can do with those stitches, how we can understand those stitches when we're looking at embroidery itself. So in a minute here, I'm going to talk about sources of inspiration. Big one for me is retail research, getting out to these stores into the places where fashion exists and looking at embroidery designs. If you go through episode 119, it will help you to understand how to break down the stitch types that you see in life, even when you can't get a digitized file to understand those. Other things I have, uh, funny enough, a, a hand embroiderer, and I'll talk about her in a minute, who is in books that I looked at when I was young in this industry. Uh, there's also a, a nice article from Printware, which I'll show you here really briefly. Uh, and this article from Printware is one of my earlier articles about retail reconnaissance, retail research. And it discusses how I go about the process of looking at designs looking at what exists in kind of the fashion world out there in the uh, kind of on in the high streets uh in fashion in regular retail shops and how i break those things down and get inspiration from them without just entirely biting the styles that are in front of me how do i how do i bring in inspiration and remix that stuff so that i'm not just copying styles but that i do understand some portion of the na the nature of these things that make them popular and make them interesting and bring that back into my own work over time. That's an older article, but I think that these processes are very similar. How do we get inspiration without you know killing that inspiration or making it something that it shouldn't be, taking that inspiration directly? We also have uh, one from Images Magazine that's coming into, uh, and the Images issue is all about um, is all about learning digitizing during downtime. Uh, the thing that's interesting about it, and we can see this, uh, we have this lovely flip book version of this. What it does have in it, I'm gonna talk about some of the places where the things we need to understand. So machines, materials, uh, stuff like that, the conventions of digitizing and all that stuff. But it also talks about the sources for where we get information and <laughs> enjoy that free advertising there. Uh, 
but we also talk about the different sources of inspiration, which is something I'm going to talk about today, but then you have it in a readable format that's kind of fun and might be a little easier for you to take in. So that will be there as well. We'll get a little bit of that involved. So there's uh, learning digitizing during downtime has some of that information we're going to talk about today, but you can review it after the fact. Uh, and then we just have some links to popular magazines because I still think that some of the magazines that are out there are worthwhile to check out. So those are the things that are in the links list today. I'll go ahead and throw that back up on screen if you want to check that out. But uh, honestly, that's what we're looking for. Linkslist.app has that there. You have all those inspirations you can check out. So when you have time, you know, throw it in your headphones while you're working on something else. I find that for me, um, I can digitize and listen to something pretty readily. The language center of my brain and the artistic side of my brain and the uh, hand that has to do the clicks is uh, usually separated enough that I can listen to this stuff at the same time. So I find that's a lovely thing to do while I am also working. I listen to audiobooks and educational stuff while I digitize kind of all the time and have for many years. So check that out on the links list. You can check that out to uh, listen to those episodes in video or read some stuff if you feel like you want to get direct with it. All right, so we have a couple of other comments here. Just wanted to bring those up. Love this. Uh, Cindy says, so outs, so outs, and more so outs. Yeah, um, stitching is the way, really. You can't become a digitizer without being an embroiderer, I think. It's not, well, let me let me crack that. People can digitize and have other people run on machines, and I don't want to make it like you can't get around without a commercial machine. I have done interesting uh, kind of experiments on little cheap, cheap home machines that have taught me about stitch types, taught me about uh, the way I'm using thread, especially because I now do more stuff for the home market than I used to. So it's I want to test on machines that are analogous to what they're going to use. But I can't tell you how important it is to actually get in front of a machine. And to once again, give you just the very brief thumbnail of how I came into this industry, um, I started out as a machine operator. And I didn't spend a long time as a machine operator before I became a digitizer, honestly. Uh, as soon as I became an operator, I certainly wanted to understand how to be in the art room because that's where I really wanted to be. I didn't just want to be running machines all day. I wanted to create things. But I was. I was an operator when I started. Um, I started out between semesters, uh, hucking boxes around in the back of a box truck. So a delivery truck, I was out there grabbing big 80-pound boxes of shirts and hucking them onto docks for different uh, clients. That's what I did first. That was my first exposure to the industry was uh, doing that stuff. And then honestly, it came to be that the embroidery department needed some help. And uh, with the embroidery department in that shop needing some help, they asked whether or not I'd be willing to try it out. And I was always willing to push buttons on the machine because I love, uh, I love machines, I love technology. And so when I saw these essentially what I considered, you know, computer controlled CNC machines, that's what the, the first thing I thought, I'm like, wow, that is super cool. Because uh, when I was younger, I had already been doing things like pixel art and digital art before the era, I mean, DOS-based stuff, before the era of modern drawing tools, before the era of vector that was widely available. I was like 256 colors as a little kid, clicking on pixels and drawing, you know, kind of 8-bit, 16-bit looking art supply stuff. That's what I was doing very early on. And I thought, man, here is a thing where people can make something digital and create a physical object. And I mean, I didn't know that at first. First thing was, cool, it's a machine. I want to make embroidery. Also, I thought, hey, I would much rather be in the climate controlled building than in the back of that box truck in the New Mexico sun all summer. I'm down to try out some embroidery. This sounds like a plan, right? So while I'm still going to school and looking to get my degree and everything else, I'm a teenager. I'm going to go ahead and uh, you know, learn this embroidery thing. Sounds great. But on that tip of kind of understanding this mix between this computer controlled stuff, something digital becoming physical, uh, at one point, I noticed there's a computer. I'm a computer kid. I had been fixing computers for uh, people who worked at my mom's company since I was like 13 years old. I had been uh, in a, a magnet school. It was originally for gifted kids, which uh, supposedly I am one. I think that's a slightly misnomer. We know now that that testing isn't everything is meant to be. But I went from a magnet school that was a gifted magnet school into, um, into a school that was a computer magnet school. So I was all about digital stuff and computers for forever. That's what I wanted to mess with. And when I was working as an embroiderer, I saw a digitizing station sitting under, well, I didn't know it was a digitizing station. I saw a computer sitting under a dust cover in the corner of the embroidery room. And I asked them like, hey, what is that thing? And they're like, oh, that's the thing that makes designs, but everybody's kind of scared to use it. They don't know what to do with it. So we haven't really done anything with it. So they had a full digitizing system in the era of extremely expensive digitizing systems. Uh, it was very basic. It was DOS based. It displayed 16 colors, if I remember correctly, and it couldn't draw a curve. 
but you could use it to plot designs. And I really, seriously, it is, uh, the beginning was my boss kind of, I always say, kind of generously allowing me uh, to stay any hours I wanted to off the clock. I had become trustworthy in the company. I had already been running by myself. I'd run, you know, kind of third shift, stayed overnight to run uh, machines before. I was there early in the mornings. They, I was able to open up shops. So I was already trusted with the key. I already had alarm codes because uh, I was a trustworthy kid. And uh, pretty much it was like, if you want to spend that extra time, you can learn. So what you have to imagine is my initial exposure to embroidery is first being taught how to run machines. And what I'm going to make clear is I, I ran one or two, often two, sometimes one, uh, 12 head machines with no thread break sensors that worked. Uh, for, we had some smaller machines at first, but we had originally uh, six needle Tajimas that didn't have thread break sensors. And you walked up and down them and you made sure that there were no thread breaks and you watched them like a hawk. And I think being that kind of watcher was probably what taught me a lot about how things came together. Because there is nothing that will help you to understand what's going to go wrong on a very machine, like watching for a thread break on a machine that has no sensors. Because you're going to walk up and down and you will watch like a hawk and have to make absolutely sure things are running correctly. And I'll say I also digitized for those machines to start. My first forays into digitizing included me running on those kind of archaic six needle 12 head machines and having to make darn sure that I wasn't going to do anything that was going to break thread or cause issues on the machine. And often with a full run of you know 12 or 24 pieces uh, as a risk, uh, because my original shop wasn't much on uh, shutting those machines down to sample. We did sample, but not as much as we eventually did once I kind of took over more of the digitizing and the, the creative part of things. And eventually, uh, to my great uh, desire, we got a single head machine that I was allowed to run for my own uh, that became a sampling machine. And that was a, the one that everybody teases me about, my old brother, uh, BAS 415 that I, I ran a nine needle machine and you'll find that I still uh, I still kind of have quite a bit of my design work will be done in nine colors because I spent a long time understanding how to make nine colors go a long way. So a lot of my work still does that. But yeah, digitizing for a machine that wasn't going to react well is a big thing I did. But what I'm going to say is there was something very valuable about that because the, it gave me technical foundations very quickly. You understand very quickly that if you pile too much density or too many short stitches in one area, the chances are you're going to cut and break down one of those stitches and end up with a thread break and lose a bunch of time and be rethreading the machine, backing it up, trying to find where your stitches were manually, find where the break was, and repairing things while flipping on and off the heads in sequence to figure out where these problems were. Or worse coming to worse, having to stop right there, find your point, edit the design, go back into the run and try and fix something if it's an egregious error and you can't keep continuing on with the design. So you learn really, really quickly how to handle that stuff, just how it is. Um, I want to go ahead and grab a couple of comments before I continue on. So, you know, there's some good stuff that's here. Uh, first, I'll briefly talk to Joe Reader. He says, I don't like satins of 1.2 mils or less. What can I use instead? Um, really depends on the kind of texture you're trying to go for. But usually I like to do things like a back stitch. You look at back stitches, so in your, in a running stitch uh, motif or in motif stitch, you can do it too. Back stitches with a tight angle can be great for that, where we kind of have a, instead of a bean stitch, we have an overlapping stitch that kind of sticks, stitches and tracks back. That can be good for that. Um, it, as we get smaller, we can go to doubled runs of straight stitch. I will often plot the doubles manually instead of using a doubled stitch. I will travel out to one side and then travel back to where I started from. Uh, because I sometimes want to offset my penetration points. I don't want my stitches to line up perfectly because then we get uh, bricky, broken looking lines and shadows. So I'll go ahead and say that directly. Um, and then down, of course, to single runs of straight stitch, depending on what we're working on. But as you guys know, if you're on a dark background, you use light colors, light colored thread on top. The shadows are much more uh, prevalent. You're going to see those and you're going to get a very stitchy or pebbled looking look to it. Um, check out that stitch choice episode that I have on there. And you're going to see me talk more about that. But yeah, um, going down below a millimeter, it depends on what you're doing. If you're going to 68 thread, we can get pretty darn small. But depending on the texture of the material, you may not like it. Uh, back stitch is great. Uh, sometimes people use bean stitch. But once again, bean stitch or tripled stitch or multiples of straight stitch will have very distinct uh, punctures. The, the penetration points will have heavy shadows and they'll look like big, thick stitches. So you will very much see them be looking stitchy and not everybody loves those. So love to answer questions. We'll go ahead and answer that one, especially also Joe Reed is one of my favorites. You guys got to know. <laughs> Barb says, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, Barb. Mike says, I've built engines and serviced and braid machines. Guess which one has tighter tolerances, far more intricate. I share the love for machines. Me too. And I'm not a real machine service guy. I've done the work I had to do 
but I trusted the machines to technicians as much as I could. I'm going to admit that. Um, have I worked on machines? Yes. Have I done maybe some sketchy repairs in the past? Absolutely. Uh, at the same time, I think I am, I am definitely not a, a tech, but I would love to go through the process of becoming a full tech someday. I think that would be beautiful. Uh, but you know how it goes. And here's this, uh, Justin says, uh, Justin, who's been a digitizer about as long as I have, uh, digitizing for the shortfalls of the machine, been there, done that. And I'll be clear, here's the other thing too. Once you learn how to control stitches and you learn how to control designs, and when you do analysis that is looking at what you've created on screen and then stitching something out and measuring the results, you can correct for a lot of stuff. And here's where uh, I'll say, do, uh, do as I say, not as I do. Get your machine serviced and don't run machines that aren't going to actually produce for you. However, <laughs> one of the machines I had at, at one of the shops I worked at, and I won't name any names, uh, one of the machines was uh, had a failing x-axis that worked, but was not scaled correctly somehow. And we never could figure out what was going on on our own. And we were not going to spend money on this very old machine that was only occasionally in service. And I literally had a percentage of horizontal distortion I would add to designs because the uh, x-axis wasn't traveling the way it should be. And I managed to get designs that would look the same as a machine that ran well, but literally there was a design named for that machine that would take this uh, overly wide, I can't really remember if it was too narrow or too wide, I think it was too narrow, this design that was too narrow, and I would literally uh, add to it so that it would come out wider than, than it should look. So on screen it looked bananas, but it ran on the machine because it was universally always that factor of being too narrow in the x-axis. So if I was really careful with it, I could actually get pretty close to what should have been <laughs> the actual machines. I don't recommend you do that, but it is something you can do because the thing to understand about all of this is whatever we're doing on screen and whatever we're doing on the machine are inherently tied together. If we make an adjustment of a certain distance on screen and then we test on the machine using the same materials we did our initial test on, the amount that we add on screen will be the amount that we get on the machine. And if we've justified for, corrected for, compensated for the distortion that was there in our initial run, we will get what we expect. It looks bizarre on screen, but we can get to where we want to go. So the first thing you have to do in any kind of digitizing is divorce yourself from the way the screen looks and realize it's not going to be the right thing. Uh, I had to learn that the hard way myself. Certainly, um, it was maybe a little easier for me, and I'll, I'll admit this, it might be a little easier for me to feel that way because my initial software, QDT, like I said before, no 3D previewing, especially no 3D previewing. My gosh, no way. I mean, because it was just, it was displaying, like I said, in like 16 colors in DOS. This thing looked like a vector graphics game, like a, it looked like Battle Zone. Imagine like a, almost Pong, right? We've got like Battle Zone for digitizing. That's what I'm using out there. It has colors, not many, and I'm only seeing drawn lines of pixels that represent stitches. That is all I'm seeing. So for me, a lot of this had to be imagination when I first started. You just had to know what you were doing and you had to be able to translate from that concept on screen to what was going on the machine. There was no 3D previewing. I was seeing what you guys might consider a wireline view all the time. And I was doing it at resolutions that uh, you haven't seen since flip phones. I mean, the resolution that we had on the monitors was not high. It was extremely pixelated comparatively to what we have now. I mean, 4K designs of 2K screens? No, not at all. We're talking about you know old school, original VGA resolutions at the best of times when I first started. Now I'm gonna tell you, we moved on to other software as soon as we could. We moved on to other software as soon as I made this thing profitable when they understood that I could do it and they had someone in house who could do it. I campaigned to get software. We bought uh, seats of software, we bought it used and it was still uh, my first real software past that was $16,000. These days, you could get the same software from anywhere for two to four thousand dollars. And honestly, if you're uh, the reason, one of the reasons I work for the folks over at Imbrilliance is because you can get stitch artists for sub one thousand dollars and have just about everything you need to do the work that I used to do as a professional. Just about. So it's one of those things where you can get a lot done with a lot less these days. And it's also why it's opened up and there's so much more cool inspiration out there, though. That's the thing. When I first started you really didn't have a lot of resources. So when I first started, yes, there was the basics. And let me let me get back to this. Let me talk about what we need to learn as digitizers briefly and just kind of go there. You know, we talked about this concept where your vision is greater than your skill. That happens. But one of the things that we need to understand, and actually, John, you who have asked this question, I think you already have this. The first thing is technical foundations, right? So that was when I was learning to deal with the compensation, push 
distortion, pull distortion, and the compensation thereof. Stitches are always getting narrower. When they stack up, they're always getting taller. So our vertical column of, of satin stitches is always getting taller and it's always getting narrower. Once we understand that and we understand things like how much we have to overlap for a border to land at the right place because things are going to pull apart, uh, when we understand that the apparent motion of the needle through a design is actually kind of pushing material in front of it, we, yes, the, yes, it's the pantograph, it's the material that's moving, but as we think of the apparent motion of the presser foot through a design, it's pushing some material in front of it. So we have to think about the fact that we're stretching our material all over the place. Once we start to get more of a handle on that, then we can do more creative work. But we have to understand first those technical foundations. So what are the things we have to understand? Um, execution, what do I mean by this? Is all the stuff about embroidery itself. If we are not executing correctly, if we can't hoop right, if we're not using the right materials, uh, if we're not using the materials for the correct reasons, we're never going to get there, especially in our testing. But we have to understand execution. And even if you're a digitizer who other people are stitching their stuff out, you have to know how the machine operates. Because what a digitizer really is, we can talk about the artistic part of the interpretation, but at its most basic, the digitizer is someone who is programming a series of motions for the machine to do. If we don't understand what those motions are going to do to the fabric that's in the hoop, we can't really know everything we need to know to get things like clean registration between outlines and borders and fills. We can't understand any better than that. And if we don't know the materials that are involved, and let's say we have different fabrics and some have stretch on the bias on the 45s, woven fabrics, especially like an even woven fabric, might be really strong horizontally, really strong vertically, but if you pull it on the 45s, it stretches all the heck. If we don't understand that fabric does that, we won't know how to add stabilizer to help it, or that we might want to change our stitch angles so that we don't have our fills all riding on the 45 so that they have the most opportunity to pull and push and distort things. We have to understand what our materials do. So you have to have a head for fabric to some degree. I'm not a great construction sewing person. I'm not going to say I, I'm not tailoring anybody's stuff. Can I do some? Sure. Do I want to do it? No. But I do know some material stuff. I do know how materials react. and I surely know how they re react to embroidery at this point. And also, I'll say this, when I don't, which I frequently don't when somebody brings me a new material, one of the first things I do is run swatch test tests on a design that I know well or on a swatch that has fills and outlines and things that are a test bed, like a tuning test you would use for any other kind of computer-controlled machine. I have designs that I run on new materials that will let me know how much trouble I'm going to have with texture that will let me know about the pull and push distortion and how much I should expect to see in the particular fabric and what I may need to change. It allows me to make changes and I do things like have multiple stitch angles on this new surface to see if we're going to have any problems with texture and with them falling in. Now these days, most of the time I can pick up a, a piece of material and I say, all right, I see how it stretches. I can see the texture and I can see the grain of it and where that's going to fall. And I know how to mitigate the problems with it. I know how to use underlay to keep things from falling into ribbed grains or different kinds of grain that might have some sort of edge issues. I know how to use um, edge run underlay to, to shore up the outside edge of a curve in a satin stitch because I know it's going to spread out and have loose density there. I know basic things and that's part of the technical foundations as well. And that's where we get into things like basic stitch types and applications. Now, yes, this is also part of the artistic interpretation thing, right? We want to know our basic stitch types. And honestly, one of the things I've uh, I've taught very recently was entirely about getting your foundations. I had a class that I taught recently that was all about these initial foundations. And certainly, we can talk about all this, but I want to kind of briefly go over some of these things. And I'm not going to teach you the entirety of my four-hour course here, of course. Uh, we only have so much time. But here are the kind of things that I'm talking about, right? First, technical foundations. A lot of people just don't know the jargon. And so I started out kind of teaching people with the jargon, right? The things that you have to know. So you got to think, know things like uh, density and how to measure it. And I'm not going to go into all of that. You can get that from the other article. Stitch angles and inclinations. What is the stitch angle and what does that mean? Uh, how do we set those and what do they look like and how do they work differently in different blocks of stitching? Uh, traditional fill stitch has one angle, but you may have a curved fill. It's a different thing depending on your software and what you have enabled. Or we can have satin stitches that work for narrow kind of ribbon-like elements. They're great for that. And we can talk about the different stitch angles, but we have to know inclinations. We have to know sequencing and what it means for things to go on top of before underneath things, travel stitching. What do we do when we wanna travel from one area to another and can we travel under something that's running on top? Pathing, how we move through a design and what it does to design. These are the basic foundation things that we need to know. What is underlay, right? We need to know those really basic things first. And I think that's something that's part of that technical foundation. And it's also, there's some of that execution. We have to know materials, we have to know all that stuff. 
And like I said, it really comes down to what I consider the three types of foundational knowledge for embroidery, materials and equipment, technical knowledge about embroidery and digitizing, and an understanding of software operation. And altogether, those are our basic technical foundations. That's the basic technical foundation. That's the stuff you have to understand. If you're already making some good designs, you probably have this. Uh, if you can make an outline hit, if you can stitch something on the right materials and you don't have issues and it's, it's fairly repeatable, you probably have the foundational knowledge in place for that. That's the technical foundations. That's the stuff you have to know just to get in the door. That's not the artistic stuff necessarily, but it will, it will become part of it down the road, right? And don't get me wrong, you have to know all of it. I consider the knowledge of embroidery more important than software operation, but what I'm going to be honest about is that if you don't get to the software operation point where you understand your tools and how to use them, uh, then the likelihood of you digitizing a great design is not going to be there. You're going to have to be able to replicate some of the things that you see once you get there, right? So, I and like I said, materials, the other thing about materials that's foundational, I'll just bring this up very briefly, is understanding design context. And this is both materials and and about design in general. We have to know that we have to work at scale because scale changes our stitch type choice. One of the most critical things about any design is the intended scale at which it will run because there is a limit to how much detail we can put into one small area. There is a limit to how wide a satin stitch or a single stitch can be before it needs to be broken up or before it, it causes issues in production. Um, though the, all of these things can be stretched to some degree, you should understand these things. Your target fabric, you have to know how it's going to react, how it's going to stretch and distort. You have to know if the textures require either additional materials to support your top stitching, or if you need to change the stitches themselves. You need to know your garment style and all the different things that can be in the way, uh, like seams and all that stuff, and also how, how large can you go on that stuff. And then you should know your color range and contrast, because that also changes how we're going to underlay and stuff like that. These are all in the basics, right? These are all in the basics. That's really what we're looking for. So the materials matter, and we understand that. We need to understand distortion, pull and push comp, and we talked about that. I will briefly bring that up, but that's something you definitely have to know. If there's a, a basic thing that causes the most problems with any embroidery per, embroiderer, any digitizer trying to get their head around things, this is it. Push and pull distortion. If you don't know it, sample things on the fabric you intend to and watch how they distort. Watch how much narrower satin stitches get. Even fill stitches will do it. Watch how much taller those columns will get and understand how things shift. It's also uh, other kinds of distortion happen. We've got pull and push distortion here, but there's other kinds of distortion. Like I talk about shape distortion. I'm going to jump through all this stuff. Understand that if you make a circle, you're going to get an oval, but you have to make an oval to get a circle with a standard fill, with a standard satin. Push and pull will distort things. Or how materials can play into the kind of distortion we have with stitch angles. These are all the basic foundations, but once we get those, then we get into things that are more about the artistic interpretation. That's where we get into that developing an eye for embroidery. Um, and like I said, I, what I really call this, and I'm gonna bring this up briefly from the slides, this is stuff you can learn from other classes and stuff you'll see in, these other, in the other sessions I've done. It's really about seeing in stitches, what do we use and when, and, it's always about breaking up the objects in front of you into smaller sections that make sense as blocks of stitches. That's it. We know that what we're looking at is not made for embroidery yet. And just because something is one area of contiguous color doesn't mean it should be one embroidery object. In fact, it often shouldn't be. And we're looking for structures we can reproduce as stitches. So we talk about identifying structures, not going to get deep into it. But you can see how I've broken up, even though there's a big field of yellow here, we've got a couple big blocks of yellow. I've got multiple satin stitches and fills that go, kind of come together to provide some texture and to describe what's there. So you have to remember that it's discrete shapes. But this is the thing, the finished size structure and the nature of the thing we're trying to depict is how we decide stitch types. Now you can go beyond this because you can create novel textures. But when we're first starting, this is probably the best way for us to go about this. What stitch type works for the right kind of piece that we're looking for? And I'm gonna do this very briefly. The stitch type uh, episode has all of this, but just very briefly, we've got our big four, manual, straight, satin, and fill. We, these are the most common in commercial and logo constraints. Obviously, I've talked about motifs. There's a whole episode on motif stitching. I've got articles coming out on that, and I've done articles before. There's more stuff we can do beyond this create, creatively. Um, certainly, there's more to it. But let's just very briefly cover the big four, and I'll show you. Manual and straight stitches, 
great for line work and engraving style pieces. It's what they're made for. They're great for that. And especially in dark colors, light on dark and you get some other stitchy issues. But you can use a manual stitch or a straight stitch to build anything else because we're just layering together lines of stitches and covering areas. One line from point to point is manual stitch. They're great for natural stuff because we can change direction with every stitch we have, but they take a lot of work because you manually place them. Straighten runs. All lines less than 0.8 mils can be done in a straighter run stitch. We can also use back stitches and other types of specialty stitches, but at first, this is the classic way we do it. But as you can see with this piece here, with lighter colors, you can see even in this 3D preview, it shows those high shadows. That's real. That is what's going to happen in your embroidery, and you may have issues with people saying something looks stitchy. If you run them white on black, um, you will see shadows at the penetration points. It's how it is but it's how thin is the line we're trying to reproduce at the size of the design that we've selected. At the intended size, how thin is the line we're trying to reproduce? If it's less than 0.8 mils with 40 weight thread, and I'm talking about 40 weight thread in all of these examples, most likely we're gonna be doing straighter run stitches. Can we do other things? Yes, like I said, back stitch is great, and we can get that up to a certain thickness, and it has some different coverage because of the way that the stitches interact with each other. Um, straight and run is a classic use. But like I said, light color on dark can cause issues. Satin stitches. If it's thinner than 10 millimeters, it's something cylindrical or ribbon-like, strokes in letters, like I said, hands and fingers, anything that is narrow and long. That is where we're looking for thinner than 10 millimeters, thicker than 0.8. That's a great place to put your satin stitches. They have a high shine and shadows, so we get a lot of dimension from satins just by using them. Highlight on the crown, shadows on the edges, especially when there's some underlay involved, it can make a very dimensional look. So like this piece, you can see arms, fingers, the belt, the edging on the garments, all done in satin stitches. And a lot of what looks like shadows in the bangles, those are not sh pieces of shading that are done. Here in the bangles on the arm, that's just overlapped satin stitches. And as they're overlapped, the natural shadows that are there provide some texture. As you can see the shine, we travel our stitch angles around the arm. We have split, uh, we have different satins that are overlapped. So we split up those different fingers and then we travel and we let that stitch angle change the color as the light reflection changes with the angle of the stitching around these shapes, these tubular shapes. So if something is tubular or ribbon-like, uh, like the edge of this garment, then a satin stitch is a great choice for that. The thing is we can use them for other stuff. You can use satin stitches to fill an entire area like I did with this lion head. I decided to use overlapped satins to fill a large area. You can use them for other things, overlapped, but it creates a rippled, shiny texture that you may not love on everything, but can be interesting used in an artistic way, right? Split satin or length limited stitch, where you want something like a satin, but it goes thicker than 10 millimeters, like on this really big monogram that I did, I used these auto split or length limit stitches to create those wide stitches, but still have the ability to have the turning stitch angle, as you can see, going through these leaves. So in this kind of, this is kind of medieval reproduction design that I did. Um, you can see that we've got this kind of turning satin and the overlapped, well, these split satins or these length limit stitches that turn like a satin stitch would and allow us to enjoy that uh, difference in color and light reflection as this moves in space or is wrapped around a round human body that is 3D, which is what this is for. This is the side of a, actually the side of a hoodie. So it's a hood. Uh, it's on the side of a hood, this big monogram, and it really does capture a lot of light, and it's interesting. So that's what we're looking for. We're looking for the way that the stitches behave. Uh, fill stitches for large areas that need to be filled. Large flat areas, fill stitches work. But can we use them for smaller stuff? Yes, we can. But that's the thing. They're great for doing things like this, like gradients and blending. Most of this is done with fill stitches. There are actually only two colors of blue here, and I've just used light densities on top of, uh, of d denser areas to create multiple shades of blue. So think about drawing with pens. When you draw with pens, you can only use the spacing between lines to create value, right? And that's how thread is. If we think of this as colored ink pens, we are drawing with lines, and the only way we can change the value with one color is how far apart are they and what do they show through in between them? What shows through from behind them? That's fill stitches. They fill big areas, but we can use them for shading. And in this piece, we've got the combination of these fill stitches. We have light fills, we have satin stitches, we have uh, straight stitches for outlining. All of that stuff is happening all at the same time, right? And fill stitch is great for gradients as well. This is multiple layers of loose fill. So these are different ways we handle stitches. But here's the thing. I'm showing you the basics and I'm doing it really fast for a reason, because those are important, right? Those are important. Basic stitch types and applications are important. 
but there are exceptions to every single one of those rules. Uh, I have made small lettering fairly small, medium size, not tiny. I wouldn't use tiny lettering with fill, but with smaller lettering, one inch high, 20 millimeter to 25 millimeter lettering, I have done so in a fill stitch with a tight satin stitch border on garments that were going to get worn heavily that I was concerned that you would catch a loop and rip them up because big satin stitches sometimes get caught and they unravel when they break. For reasons, either artistic or physical, we can break those rules. So what am I gonna say about this, right? Um, there is no right or wrong, necessarily. It's not right or wrong. Let me, let me clarify what it is. There's no wrong, there's no right to the interpretation and uses of stitches. However, <laughs> however, as I often say, but <laughs> there is no right or wrong, but there is a caveat. What there is, is what is feasible, what is possible to do, what makes sense, what works technically, what will hold up on the particular material, what will hold up in your software, and what is unrealistic. Sometimes there's too much detail in a small area. We must reduce the detail to arrive at a density that will run correctly, or that allows us to have the amount of whatever's behind that detail showing through, or to not make a big knot that is uncomfortable to wear in the design uh, and have a lot of buildup on the back and front of the design of thread. Even if it's possible sometimes, you may find things that are unrealistic. So what we really have is this battle in our heads. What, like, what is the big battle that we're actually dealing with? What is it? The versus, right? What's the big battle that we're dealing with? It's actually feasible versus unrealistic. There are things we can do and even force our machines to do that are unrealistic, but are feasible, but, uh, but are possible, but they're not really feasible. They're not something you're going to do over the long term, and you're definitely not going to be production friendly. But let's grab a couple comments before I kind of give you a little bit more about the stuff that I was doing before, the kind of stuff that I did to learn this stuff. But let's talk about it real quick here. Uh, so John says, if you're using a purchase font, you need to stretch them in order to compensate for push and pull. Sometimes, yes. Depends on the font. What I'm going to say is this. When you use a purchased font, part of the problem is a lot of them are digitized. Uh, even the native fonts are made where you can scale them up and down, right? The thing is, um, pull compensation and push compensation change with scale. And especially if we think about push compensation, where like the top and bottom of an I column pushes a certain amount, if the density stays the same between an inch letter and a two inch letter, that push compensation on the same material hasn't changed a lot. So if it's digitized where someone stopped their columns short and it was digitized at one inch and you scale it up to two inches, you're going to find that that compensation is probably too big. It's too much compensation, it won't work right. So you may need to. Not all the time. And also, those things were made for one type, or at least they were made for kind of a general set of fabric settings. We can increase or reduce pull compensation. Not all softwares even have a push compensation uh, option, especially not for lettering objects. So we may have to break our lettering objects into uh, regular digitizing objects and do some of that compensation ourselves. It can be the case, even with digitized pieces, because the thing is, they're digitized for a range, but even when they allow you to scale quite a bit, there is always an amount of scaling you can do that breaks the compensation that's built in. So, and here's the thing, if you stitch it out and you see that it's not compensating correctly, yes. If you stitch it out and you find out that on your material with the fonts that are particularly made for, even if it's made for this material, you may find that at your sizing with your material, um, it's not compensating the way you want it to or on your machine, whatever it is. And we compensate for what we see in our stitches. What we see on the machine is the only thing that matters. The other thing I'm gonna tell you is a lot of digitizers expect, and I know I certainly expect, that people will add a little bit of compensation. It's usually the case that people add a little bit of pull compensation uh, to their designs as they're running them. I don't know what material I'm going on. If I'm making something for stock, I'm going to assume a very small amount of comp that's normal for you, and I will allow for it. So I'm probably not going to digitize the comp in on something that's scalable. That's something that a user is going to be expected to do, especially pull comp. You're going to be expected to adjust that to the fabric you're running on. So yeah, can be. Uh, Joe, by the way, Joe Kramer, if you didn't see our two other guys episode this morning, thank you, Joe, for commenting. Joe showed some incredible stuff. He did a bunch of development work for Abercrombie and Fitch and uh, applique work, stunning work. Uh, go see that episode this morning and see Joe's stuff. He's done some great stuff. But he says, I like to use satin fill to save stitches when you need to cover a lot of area, but don't want the stitch count or ba to battle with smaller satin stitch text over the top. Long live satin. Absolutely. I've used a lot of satin, uh, overlap satin. And in fact, one of the things I want to talk about, I'm going to talk about getting inspiration. That's what we're going to do for our bonus time today is talk about where I got inspiration. A lot of my inspiration early on was looking at old samples of embroidery. And some of that was um, 
some of that was actually military. And I found a bunch of older military patches were done uh, very likely on machines like um, uh, like the old school machines that had a a Meistergram is one of the big ones everybody knows. They actually stitched all of their uh, stitches horizontally, and it meant that there were uh, lots of filled areas that were made with overlapped satin stitch, essentially, zigzags. They were overlapped just enough to make sure that the color coverage didn't split apart, and that's how they made big coverage areas. That was just standard on those machines. It's really all you can do, because they don't, they don't work like an embroidery machine you understand now, right? And ones that were hand guided, there was a lot of people filling with a hand guided machine that has zigzag on it. They were using uh, overlap zigzags to do that. So I actually learned that from looking at Militaria, old patches. Uh, old patches taught me a bunch of that stuff. So that's the thing. I looked at old examples of embroidery. And when I saw that was possible, I went ahead and said, all right, I'm going to go into my software. How can I make overlapped rows of satin stitch? And how can I connect those in such a way that they're going to make a filled area? I find it does add some more stress to the material, but depending on your material, you can do some incredible stuff. So, you know, it's pretty cool. Uh, and by the way, Jeremy says, love this one. The shading is amazing. I think you're talking about the, uh, and that's the, that's only a three color. Like that's not that bad. I've done, I did the rig rainbow one is the one that killed me, but yeah, um, that's a big, that's a big thing. The, the, the flame font, Daryl also liked that one. I'll pull that one back up and I'll just go ahead and show you guys this and say, you know what, this, this is not an easy thing to do necessarily. Uh, in this case, I'm using four layers of quarter density fill. And I'm tapping them exactly into position. And I'm actually using um, custom break lines for my stitch penetration points that I laid out in essentially as vectors. I'm using custom break lines to make sure that the texture looks like a standard fill. So to get this to work, and this is uh, not, it's not actually in Brilliance. The original one was done on this one is done in Wilcom. But to get this to look the way I wanted to and not get a weird brick-like texture, I wanted to have a smooth to Tommy like texture, the only way that I could achieve that with the way the software works, because if I layered in those layers of, of uh, fill, we'd end up with all the, uh, each row of fill was lining up, the stitch penetration points were lining up and it looked like big bricks. It makes a kind of texture that I don't really love. I wanted a smooth texture that looked like it was printed. It's funny now as a, you know, a color reel could do this much easier these days. But in this case, I'm using three colors of, of embroidery thread to do this and I'm layering multiple objects. So each one of these objects has like 12, you know, 12 pieces to it. Each one of these letters has 12, have 12 pieces of light fills layered on top of each other in three colors in order to reach a target density that, by the way, I will say this, this one's like water. It's just a standard density. It's a 0.4 density. You can fold it. It does not build up because I have aligned all the multiple layers of stitching until they line up together and lock together. And it's like one density of fill from top to bottom. But how did I learn this stuff? Uh, multiple ways, right? One of the ways I learned it was from seeing designs people had made. And I'll actually go ahead and credit uh, somebody who teaches it now who also teaches this stuff directly. So you can learn from designs, but you can also learn from people teaching directly. And one of the people who teaches this quite a lot is uh, Lee Caracelli of Balboa. She teaches this all the time. She teaches blending, and this is uh, very similar to her method. Uh, her method uses light density fills on top of each other. But I think this really plays into this concept of when we think about our stitch, right? There's only one kind of stitch that we can make on our embroidery machines. It's a line of color from one point to another, and we're drawing with those lines of color. How would we get something to blend from one side to the other? We have to intersperse lines of color. It's the only way. Once we start thinking of it like that and thinking about the physicality of the thread, we will be able to piece that stuff out. Think about laying colored uh, pencils, unsharpened colored pencils or pickup sticks, if you're old enough to know what pickup sticks are or chopsticks, whatever it means. Let's say we have three different colors of pencils and we're stacking them all together. How would we achieve a gradient? By deciding how many pencils. There's one of this one, then one of this one, and then one of this one, and now we have a 50-50 blend of the two colors. That's how we learn about it. We think about how things are put together and we learn from other people's designs or we get direct education from someone who knows. I mean, I've taught this, Lee teaches this stuff and it's all similar stuff, right? It's it's the interesting to think about. And uh, thank you, Mike, for this. He says, I love that drawing with lines. Easy to forget that line is also straight. No matter what, it's a straight line for penetration to penetration. Absolutely. Anything you draw on a curve, you're actually drawing a polygon with lots of little sides. That's all you're able to do. So especially with a straight stitch, you're always doing that. Why do we have stitches that get shorter in tight curves? Why do we end up with more penetration points? Because we have to approximate the curve through small straight segments. 
the limitations and the understanding of those limitations of the embroidery machine uh, will free us. Funny enough, we learn the limitations and then we can stretch what it's possible for them to do. But I'm going to talk about inspiration for a minute. I mean, all that stuff was cool. The technical stuff is cool, but I've taught that before. I want to talk personally about some things that, you know, that I think are interesting to observe and to think about, right? So we talked about the right or wrong. We talked about what we're doing. We're developing the eye for embroidery, right? How, how are we going to develop the eye for embroidery? Well, certainly we need to develop an eye some, somewhat for art and for images in front of us in general, but a lot of it is understanding what's possible in embroidery and what's possible with thread. And what I want to make sure I, I bring us back to is one of my favorite phrases. I say it all the time. In fact, I, uh, Jeff, to your great credit, I tuned into your one of your lives and you were like, as Eric always says, because I'm, I'm always hashing on about this bad enough that poor Jeff has it in the back of his head too. Uh, consume broadly, create with focus. And what do I mean by this? Um, consume broadly don't just look at machine embroidery digitizing tutorials it sounds like what you want but it limits you to a degree if we only look at the basic conventions of machine embroidery if we only look at people who are teaching you with standard embroidery threads so it's all 48 thread it's all polyester or rayon we are doing everything with the basic four stitches that are common to every design if that's all we ever learn we do limit ourselves and our creativity to some degree. Now, it doesn't mean we don't learn a lot. Most things are made out of those. And you can make incredible designs out of those. But the way we get a little bit beyond it is by consuming more. And I would say you can start in a smaller ring where you say, OK, I'm going to go from uh, just machine embroidery tutorials to just looking at machine embroidery in general. I want to see what's possible with an embroidery machine. And then I'm going to go out to um, any kind of maybe hand-guided embroidery that's still on a machine. Then I'm going to go out to hand embroidery. I'm going to go look at textiles and woven materials. So now any kind of way that I can make a mark with thread or fibers, heck, look at weaving. Why would it bother you? It's stuff that we can look at for concepts on how we can make colors, how we can make shapes, how we can make decorations with fibers, which is what we're doing. Straight lines. Hey, look at pen and ink drawing. Look at someone who's doing things with colored pen and inks where we're not blending. We, it still has a limitation similar to ours. Look at someone who's drawing with markers and see how they create value through cross hatching and through line work. Look at somebody who's inking line work for comic books. Why not? These are all things that are similar and are kind of adjacent to what we do. And look at more than that. Then just look at art. Look at the way people use color. Look at different kinds of textiles, especially. But then go out to art in general. How do people make marks? How do people make lines? How do they draw things? Look at, by the way, you want to learn how to do uh, lettering very well? Watch calligraphy videos and see how they break up the letter into strokes with a broad pen. Because all lettering, all typefaces are originally derived, or at least by, by the largest part, maybe not all, the largest part of the text and fonts and typefaces that we understand are derived originally from broad pen calligraphy or letters drawn with a broad pen. The way that they break up designs for calligraphy is very similar to the way you would break up a glyph with satin stitches that are ribbon-like and are very much like a calligraphic stroke. Consume broadly and create with focus. You have to take an inspiration. And I'm going to be honest and say, I took inspiration from everywhere. Certainly, like I said, you seek inspiration. And a lot of it is going to be embroidery. I joke around about retail research. You know, what is retail research? Well, I'll bring up the little article here again. Why not? Uh, it's going to the, the shops and seeing stuff. Heck, Joe, you might see some of your work here because you're working for Abercrombie and & Fitch and I was going to stores. But you go look at what people are doing and you say, what's common? What's cool right now? And at the time I was writing this, there was a lot of like patterned appliques and I thought that was pretty cool. There were these kind of semi military Boy Scout shirts that were popping up in like American Eagle and other shops like that. And I was seeing a bunch of that stuff out there. I was seeing the original rise of patches. And this is 2014. And this is some of the rise of patches becoming uh, popular commercial and fashion artifacts. I was seeing, you know, here's some stuff from American Eagle. There was some rough uh, chain stitch. So chain stitch was coming in. There was a lot of laces and bohemian shirts. There was, like I said, tons of cut applique work. And then I started playing around and saying, okay, what can I do with that? And I started making inspired looks. I'd be like, all right, I drew some stuff. I drew this design for uh, Black Duck that was pretty cool. I drew a t-shirt design, which is not usually my thing. But hey, hand-drawn type, uh, hand lettering was a big thing right then. So I started to do hand-drawn type and then some things that kind of mocked hand-drawn type. Sadly, this one never got produced, but I, I still like that one. It was one that I enjoyed. I sketched. I'm not a great artist. I never took art. Uh, art class. I have one college drawing class and then the rest of it was me teaching myself. And then I'll admit going to uh, Von Glitchka's classes on vector got me get better with vector. 
Um, but a lot of my stuff was just sketched on apps too. I went ahead and did some stuff that was in this way using uh, the metallic threads, using the textures that I saw. And I made some pieces to kind of mock that stuff and to say, what would I want to do that's similar? You know, what, what do I like? What do I think I would do that's in that similar vein, right? And so, you know, you work at things by understanding them through at first through copying, through understanding what they are, how they're put together and looking at how the stitches are put together, but then by uh, it, imitating and doing a different take. So when I started to see all of this kind of military stuff come up, I saw all this stuff showing up, military, Boy Scout type stuff popping up. And by the way, if you ever feel bad about your stitching, look at some of the quality on these full tilt uh, garments at retail. Trust me, you'll be you'll feel better about yourself that day. And then I designed my a uh, series you guys might have seen it had the, the garden gorilla series that had garden gorilla and seed bomber and harvest heroes and these ones i sketched and drew out myself um and then designed them combining something that my wife loved which is gardening and this movement this uh, garden gorilla movement which is where you would plant open spaces like you had empty lots that looked terrible in your neighborhood you dig them out plant them full of natural occurring uh, native wildflowers and they look great and they're better spaces and i thought what a cool way to take something where it's like the, the feeling of the military and patches with the concept of this movement that was going on with garden gorillas and with people growing stuff in their front yards and make a mash, a mix up. Something where I use some of the techniques that I saw, some of the artistic cues I saw, some of the color palettes I saw with my interpretations and with my art. And it's something that I did when I was doing that retail, but that's a little bit later, right? The retail recon's there. But when I first started out, I have to say, I just didn't have a lot to work from. And so in learning digitizing and art interpretation, I had to work with what I had. And a lot of it started out with, first and foremost, with what I had on hand to learn the technical stuff, documentation. I had the manual from my software. I had the manual from my embroidery machine. And I had the ability to run through the stuff. And eventually, I got industry magazines. And when I, I found an old industry magazine in the drawer of one of the people who had worked in production. And I was like, what is this thing? And I was just... I was enamored immediately and I begged to get industry magazines because I had never seen anything. I was just working on my own. And once I started getting those industry magazines, I saw people who were doing the thing I wanted to do. And I was, believe me, I was starstruck. Uh, later on, as I started writing for the magazines, when I first, I started winning contests, uh, you know, around 06, I believe was my first one that I won, a digitizing contest I entered in the magazines. And I started to write for the magazines after that and writing blogs and magazines. And I was starstruck the first time I talked to people like, you know, uh, like Bonnie or Jerry Lee or the people that we all know who used to write for the magazines in the, at the time, I was super starstruck. And they were people like me who just doing the job. So, I mean, that's, and that's how I still, to this day, I still love the fact that I got to know some of the people who inspired me at the time, but it was, it was documentation, both the official documentation from my software. And then it was the stuff that was published in the industry. Uh, and then after that, really what it was, it was experimentation, working on designs and trying stuff out for myself, really analyzing and looking at design. So just doing like the retail research and then also just looking at different examples of embroidery and taking it in. How did this thread laid together, make this color change, make this style? And admittedly, I learned a lot of things were not going to be exactly possible. We A lot of handwork is done by looping or cording or couching or things that are not really something you can do very simple, similarly on an embroidery machine. We're not tying any knots on, the, on our surface because we can't do that. Our machine can make a line from point to point. But I could see how they laid threads together, the angle of the thread, the length of the stitches, the color of the thread, and how those were put together into uh, groups in order to make certain kinds of marks and textures. And that was experimentation and, and getting, like I said, getting inspiration from different sources. Later on, as the internet came around, as I got to talk to people, and don't don't get me wrong, guys, I wasn't so long ago that I was doing this. I mean, I was digitizing in like 99. Um, I had a website from the earliest days when I was in uh, you know high school and college. But when the internet became the social internet, when web 2.0 really made its mark and it became what it is now to a great degree, then we have communities. And now you guys have communities and you have this. You have things like this that are kind of like direct education, but they are community efforts. You have the other people in the comments here. You have Facebook groups. You have uh, people you're following on Instagram. You have people you're following on TikTok who discuss things in the comments. You have a wider community and the kind of broadcasting that they do to learn from and get inspired by. And then you have direct education, folks like me, folks like the guys over the embroidery nerd, people like Lisa Shaw, my uh, compatriot in brilliance, who also teach direct classes who can teach you things one-on-one. -on -one. Those are things you have, but I'm gonna admit for me, 
I had documentation and I had experimentation. And that's where I started. But that's the thing. It was all sorts of inspiration. I was seeking inspiration. I was consuming broadly. And what it really came down to was, number one, certainly retail research. These days with the internet in front of you, if there's a kind of embroidery you like, you can find it. I'm not saying everybody's embroidery is equally awesome or every version of what's out there in machine embroidery is something you want to copy. But if you see something excellent and you can make out the stitches, you can learn just by looking at their piece roughly, especially if you can roughly get the, the concept of how big the design overall is. You've got design size, stitch type, stitch angle, roughly you can kind of figure out density. You can certainly tell a light density from a full coverage density. And you might not know sequence, but because you can see what's layered on top of each other, you can learn a little bit about sequence, if not pathing. Pathing is the one thing that you're gonna be lacking, but looking at an existing piece of embroidery out there, you can do what I sometimes call retail research. Look at other people's work and see how they put together and make notes. Get into it, nerd out, analyze. Analyze existing designs. If you have them, if you have the digital designs, it's awesome to watch them run. One of the best things you have in your software is the slow replay or the film strip. Watch the designs run digitally repeatedly to see how things are put together. Watch them and, and measure. The other thing you have is their measuring tool. Usually the M key on your uh, on, on most softwares. Punch that M key and get a ruler out on your design and find the real widths of blocks of stitches, the real density. If you haven't checked that out, go back to my stitch types and it'll teach you how to measure density from an existing design, even if it doesn't have it listed, even if you don't have the objects and measure those designs. Also, analyze embroidered examples. Go back to the episode where I talked about that and you, I'll go into more detail, but still look at the designs that are in front of you and say, how were these threads, these stitches grouped together? If you can make a stitch, you can reproduce anything. If you can see the stitches, you can analyze large parts of how they're put together, especially if you know what your software tools are capable of and how to make stitches in your particular software, then it's easier to do that work, but you can analyze. You literally look at the embroidered piece and say, all right, this is how wide this piece is. This is what kind of stitch angle it has. It has a turning angle. Um, it has breaks in it. They're regular. This is probably either fill or an, a split satin of some kind or a length limit. It's a, it's a piece that's this broad, it's this long. It's on top of this other piece. I can talk about the layering. I can talk about the stitch types. I can talk about what is done for this thing for texture? Is the texture randomized or is it regular? Is it smooth or is it not? What kind of thread is being used? Is it super de uh, dense and tight or are there loose densities? Do I see multiple colors layered into each other? Are they on top of each other? Are they at different angles on top of each other or are they at the same angle? All of this stuff is available to you just at looking at the design. And honestly, I have been a menace with the camera phone through most of my career. And to illustrate that, I'm gonna bring back up the uh, thumbnail for this time around. If you look down at the bottom of this thing, the good people at American Eagle were probably waiting for me to get the heck out. These are pictures made with a, I'm not joking, a feature phone. So I could barely see what they were when I first was trying to look at distressed applicant. I was seeing it on the high street, right? I was seeing it in the fashion <laughs> kind of sphere. I was looking at these designs and trying to analyze them and taking pictures. I was looking, as you can see up there, at vintage pieces of embroidery that I found and trying to see how they were put together with their different textures. Then I was analyzing designs that were in, you know, in the collection that my uh, company had of old hand-punched designs and measuring everything. I was taking everything apart and trying to figure out how to put it back together. This is how you do it. You study what's in front of you and it absolutely makes things easier to tell. Uh, like John says, he wants to learn more about patches. Go look at patches. And when you see one that's cool, stop and take notes. Save the picture, stick it on a piece of paper, do it by hand if you like doing it analog. If not, go and throw it into a document and sit there and make notes about how it's put together. And then think about how to sit and ruminate on that sucker get into your software, throw a picture of that thing in your software and try and copy it. Seriously, digitize right on top of the old embroidery and then add your compensations to make it work on your machine. Once you've learned how to break down that piece that you love, then take a new piece of art that has nothing to do with it and use the techniques from that piece that you love on the new piece of art. Find analogous structures. You have something that has this certain kind of lettering that you love, Look for lettering like that in a piece of embroidery and then copy how they broke those glyphs apart and how the satin stitches were put together. It's how we learned back in the day. It's how a lot of us learned. Even when we mentored with someone, people who I know who mentored with somebody, what did the person have them do? 
run machines, look at their files. Run the machines and watch them run. Look at their files and figure out how they're put together. And often copy a file, just like I'm telling you how to do. It's very much in that kind of guild mentality of becoming a journeyman is copy the work that your master has done until you can be masterful at it and then apply those techniques to new work. It's not that it's not that weird, but I do want to mention a couple of random things that I think are interesting. Um, before we finish up here, I'm not going to go super, super long, but we'll go for a little bit longer. We'll go into official bonus time, which is always 15 minutes after the hour, uh, but we'll talk about this, right? So we're analyzing existing designs. We're analyzing embroidery that's out there, developing theories on the observed stitches. And I know it sounds like I'm being a super nerd. Number one, yep, I'm a super nerd. Number two, we develop a theory on how these things are put together because we might not be right, but that's okay because we're gonna test our hypothesis by doing the next stage, which is creating test designs or swatches. The other thing is, if you're looking at a big jacket back that has a cool kind of stitch type that you wanna play with, you don't have to digitize the whole jacket back. Find the most elemental version of it. You were looking at that lion jacket back that I did earlier and you see those overlapped satin stitches. You don't have to digitize a lion head to copy it. Jump in, look at the part that's interesting to you and digitize a swatch of overlapped satin stitches with some rough edges on them and see how they look. Check out your settings maybe make a couple of different swatches where you change how much feathering you used or how far you overlap them, run out the swatches and then make some inferences, some testing and some uh, concept into real data. Take that data back and write that down and say, this is what turned out and save that final sample along with your file. Make sure they're marked the same so that if you want to go back to that palette of settings to figure out something else later or use those settings, you'll know how to make them happen. Create test designs and swatches. So you, do, so you analyze, you develop your theories on what's there, how it's put together, create some test designs with the software you have to see if you've got them there, and then do smart testing. Which I've talked about this millions of times, but it's like you, you sample, you measure if there's anything that's wrong, you alter things that need to be, you revise and you run it, you stitch again, you test. So the concept is that we're going to we're going to check something out. We'll stitch it out. If there's anything wrong with it, we measure things that are wrong with it for compensation, stuff like that. Or we analyze, we, we remark, we mark on what the things are that are incorrect that we want to change or the things we might want to change. Uh, we go and alter the things. We do our revisions and we test out. And once we test those things out, we'll know whether or not our revisions made sense. And we just do that cycle until we get where we want to get. Yes, that sounds tedious. You'll get better. The more you do, the more you have a deeper understanding of how this stuff's going to work and your first effort will often be fruitful. So it's really what it is. But you know, like I said, where do you go for education? Yep, documentation's great. Know your software, know your machine, know the general stuff that we all need to know. Go go get books from people who know better. Hey, watch stuff like you're watching here with me. Uh, you can consider me a first example, you know, someone who's doing that. I mean, people like me are teaching from their experience. That's fine. But Really, experimentation is where it's at to finally figure it out. And if you're ever going to develop anything new, you're going to have to do some uh, targeted experimentation. It's coming. That's just something you're going to have to do. Uh, certainly talk to your community, but understand, take it with a grain of salt. Not everybody is at the same skill level and not everybody's trying to achieve what you want to achieve. But you find somebody who's making things that you want to make, listen to them. If they are making things that you want to make, they look good, listen to them, try it out. And you may find not everything that they do is what you want to do, but there's a good chance that if they're getting repeatable results themselves and they're willing to share, uh, that you'll be able to at least get the results they're getting and then be able to tweak for the kinds of differences you want between their work and yours. And then, hey, if you have the chance to get direct education, you can come out to a trade show where someone's teaching. You can take an online class with somebody who can teach you this stuff directly, especially if it's really relevant, if the topic is relevant to what you want to do. Go ahead and do that because what we're often doing isn't necessarily going to be you know, groundbreaking stuff that's going to teach you stuff that's never been done before. What we're often doing is removing the stumbling blocks, keeping you from having to trip and fall into all the pitfalls along the way so that you get directly to the creative kind of experimentation. Because the first experimentation you're doing is literally just trying to get your execution right, trying to get your technical foundations. That is a lot of what happens when you're first digitizing is getting your technical foundations under your belt. After that, after we get that, we start to develop the eye. We start to see how we can break down anything that's in front of us, any image into a certain kind of stitches, layering of stitches, different kinds of thread elements to make things look the way we want them to look, to get different colors and gradients and variations and textures. And we learn that through all of this experimentation, certainly, but also through all the inspiration. And I mean, seriously, this is down to going to the library and looking in the 
a Dewey Decimal section that has embroidery and needlework in it and thumbing through books. That's how I started because when I first started, there wasn't that much content online that was that great. Luckily, you folks are going to be able to go online and see almost everything being produced, often on video live by somebody who wants to show you. But don't just look at tutorials. Go look at something being produced. Look at a fashion brand that's showing their embroidery being run. Look at someone describing a piece. Look at someone talking about a historical piece. Go to a museum with textiles involved. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've spent that time. And in fact, what I'll say is one of the things I have done while I've traveled in teaching, one of the things that I do make time for as much as I can it's museums. And if you go into my camera roll at any given time, yes, you're going to see me uh, showing my wife my uh, lunch that I bought on the way out there. But you'll also see me sometimes uh, making fun of the embroidery that's there at the Art Institute of Chicago. Uh, but the rest of the time, you're going to see me looking at art pieces. Most of my camera roll, when I come back from any given uh, assignment, if I've been given an extra day, um, lately I haven't been able to travel like this much, but especially back in the early days when I could travel and have an extra day or two, Believe me, when I went to Chicago, this is someplace I was going, and you're better believe that I was looking at examples of textiles in all different sources. Uh, and yes, absolutely, all kinds of different art. I'm looking at the way sculpture is done. I'm looking at the kind of values that are had in relief sculpture. I'm looking at how people use light and shadow, because that's all part of what we're doing, certainly. But of course, you better believe that I'm looking at needlework. You better believe that I'm going to be out here looking at how thread is being used for different things, whether it's counted work or whether it's traditional needlework that we understand. Yes, I'm looking at statuary and painting and carvings and jewelry and everything else. But absolutely, you think that I'm not stopping to take a minute and look at the examples of textiles in any museum? Of course I am. I'm looking at folk art. I'm looking at textiles. I'm looking at... Um, traditional stuff that's being done. I'm looking at modern stuff that's being done. Any way that marks are being made with thread or in an analogous fashion to what we do, I want to see that stuff because you never, never know. When you'll be looking at a hand piece and go, hey, what is that rippled kind of texture? Well, if we allow all of our stitch penetrations to line up, and let's say I use straight stitches with thick thread to create this petal instead of using satin stitches or fills, I could get this kind of rippled texture and that might be interesting. How about this? We talk about rendering a leaf with two satin stitches. You want to know how long that's been being done? Well, it's more than 100 years for sure. Looks more like a couple hundred years. Depends. 1800, right? <laughs> 1800 to 1850. Yeah. So we've been doing some stuff for a while. We've been rendering things and using stitch angles to represent color and to get different effects for a while. We have been using textures in embroidery for a while and we might learn some things. But that's the thing. We can look at all these different textures and it doesn't always have to be embroidery, but when it is, you know, extra bonus. Uh, you know, we've got a, a patterned piece that was pre-embroidered for a waistcoat here. Beautiful stuff. Are we going to use that in logo embroidery all the time? Maybe yes, maybe no. Uh, but <laughs> despite my my funny uh, my, my funny selfies and stuff that are here, and obviously you guys know with all the Viking Age stuff that I get excited about, you know that I was... Uh, Super excited to be next to some Ulf Bert sword. So yeah, some uh, some historical swords and stuff from the from the Viking Age. But yeah, there there's all sorts of work. There's all sorts of textiles out there. There's uh, like surviving um, medieval pieces. If you can get to a museum, go and get to a museum. But if you can't, go check out a museum collection online and see the cool stuff. Go look at these images because even from the images I just showed you you know that if you looked at this for a while and zoomed in on a piece, you could figure out a little bit about how I could use motifs to recreate some of these designs that were done by hand, how I could use some of the shading that's seen in these birds, how you could use the different stitches to get uh, textures into leaves and flowers, especially if you're doing decorative work that was directly analogous, then you can really learn something. And even if not, let's say we're doing some logo work what if we just want to have a cool edge texture on an applique? Well, I'm seeing some interesting textures here. I can imagine using some weird edge textures that I'm seeing in this piece on a commercial applique. Why not? We could program a motif and do it. We have the tools. The ability is not that different. What we can do with our machines, what we can do with our thread is not that different. And all these sources of mark making are worthwhile, right? So 
like I said, you want to consume broadly, even when it doesn't seem like it might necessarily be directly related to what you're doing. But then you can also be more focused. You can look at things that are more in your wheelhouse. I mean, that was all museum stuff. But if you don't think that I go into, you know, stores at the mall, streetwear stores, if uh, where whenever I go to an airport, I look at every stand full of souvenirs with uh, resort wear hats and um, sweatshirts. Because frequently, the designs themselves, the subject matter, which is, I am at X state or X place, is not that interesting. What has to be interesting about those pieces usually is the texture, the materials used, the colors. Something else about the design has to be interesting because most of the time, the subject matter itself doesn't carry the design by itself. So you're going to see that resort wear is a great place to see all kinds of new applications and textures because they've got to look for something to make uh, I'm in Texas novel. We consume all this stuff and we get inspiration from it. We can create more as we get back from it. And in fact, one of the things I remembered, and I just wanted to show this because it was something that a memory that came to me today. And this is the works of, this is in our local library when I was very young. Like I said, I started doing this when I was very young, comparatively to a lot of folks. Now, I'm not that young compared to like Adam here, who's Adam Fuller, who's listening, who's like 11, right? When he started his stuff, 10 or 11 is, is I don't know when he did his first designs, but you know, I'm, I'm a teenager and I was just looking through anything embroidery. And this was, um, Helen Stevens did these really interesting pieces. She had all these pieces where she was using uh, thread along angles and got these just intensely cool textures. And I'll just kind of show you some of the fun stuff that's here. She had all of these books that were in our local library. Can I use this necessarily for uh, digital stuff that we would do for logo digitizing? Maybe not, but check out the overlapped textures and check out how that silk thread is carrying that light across that surface. And these are some of the original things that I saw when I was first seeing hand embroidery uh, when I was looking for inspiration. And one of her books was actually in my local branch of my local library. And I looked at it repeatedly. Um, doesn't mean this is something that we're always going to mess with. Yeah, no, I mean, this is not something that I can do with all my, my traditional work. But I can certainly think about stitches in a different way because these aren't necessarily satins. She's doing one stitch at a time and she's doing work. Look at those little claws. If you ever see some of my work where I do birds, I stop and do the talons with these little straight and manual stitches. And Though I didn't copy it directly from her, when I'm looking at these little claws on this bird, the little talons that are on this bird, I'm going to say, you know, I'm sure that some part of that absorbed into me when I was looking at her work and flipping through, the, through these books. But I remember thinking that. And then also I saw very early on, and I think I can grab, there's an example on her web store that I put in here. Uh, in my pieces here where she she shows this uh, dragonfly. I don't know if I can show you a really good example. Maybe I can see the details on this piece. But she did all these dragonfly wings where she drew these kind of hexagons made of thread. These light open meshes that she d distorted a little bit in order to make these dragonfly wings. And I thought, man, those were just great. Um, she had stitches that are way overly long and it's something we wouldn't do in uh, machine embroidery. And these were tied together but it was just a cool way to make surface texture and it was irregular and I loved it. And that's the thing. When you cast a wide net and look at things that are outside of your you know, normal experience, you're gonna find cool, new, interesting things to find. Uh, do I think that Helen's books are a good buy for commercial digitizers? I don't know, maybe, maybe not, but you're certainly not hurting yourself by having a look at something interesting and seeing how could I fill a space with stitches that's not a standard tatami fill that starts from one end and ends at another side with a single angle? Is it work we're going to do for every client? No. If we're filling a large area, most of the time for most clients, we're going to use a fill stitch. We're not going to go running around making cool spirals manually with our software. But when we have a big client who wants to make something excellent, who's willing to spend some money with us, who wants to have something different, Thinking about texture, thinking about the different ways we can use our tools, thinking about what stitches can do and realizing that maybe a curved fill, maybe a couple layers of curved fill with a little bit of detail work done manually might make a more interesting texture than a standard fill. We might get something that's just a little more impressive that just has a little edge, a little glint, a little glimmer that makes something look better. Uh, a little bit of shading here or there doing some work with texture, breaking up something that's a big silhouette into multiple pieces so we can change stitch angles and have a relief type 
exposure of stitch angles and light and reflection, things like that that may not take a tremendous amount of time, but can add a lot of texture. Maybe using an applique that has texture in it or that has a different quality to the shine or to the way that it reflects light instead of just going with a standard fill. Maybe using rough thread instead of smooth thread, things that we might see because looking at some of those historical examples that were like uh, wool threads, you see how we could use a thicker, fuzzier thread and get some really cool textures or define a shape with less stitching. And we could have something interesting that we can then apply to really commercial lettering. We could apply to logo work. We could apply to mascots or team sports or things that we are doing in the commercial world. Or if, when the, if we are doing something artistic or doing something that's specifically uh, creative in that way, we really have a larger palette of inspirations to choose from and a larger palette of things to aspire to. Even if we don't do exactly what's there, can't do exactly what's there, we have different ways of making marks that are interesting and novel to our clients and in our work. So with that, I'm going to check the comments one more time, see what else we have. And by the way, we have a couple things here. Joe says, and I, I totally agree with this. Yes, by studying calligraphy, you can anticipate the push-pull of the fabric while you punch the file. I try to avoid direct perpendicular overlaps of intersecting areas. Yeah, for sure. It's something we kind of work with. We tip it, tip in our ends. That's something I often do. You have to kind of uh, fight with how you're going to do overlaps like that. But yeah, understand calligraphy strokes absolutely makes it easier to do text and font work. Uh, and that's something I've done. Uh, manual calligraphy, I've done a lot of scrolls and stuff earlier on in my career. So I've done some manual calligraphy work. I'm, I'm super rusty right now and probably can't do hardly anything. <laughs> probably some black work while I looked at a, at, a, uh, <laughs> at a teaching guide while I was doing it. John says, such great info. I'm glad to hear that, John. Hopefully that helped a little bit. And uh, as you know, I've got to contact out to you with more info to help out. And yeah, <laughs> Ramona says, wax on, wax off. Yeah, you have to take some time and study this stuff. You developing these skills requires some practice, but we should give ourselves the grace for some practice. And like I said, cast that wider net, consume broadly and create with focus, bring in the inspiration. Then, like I said, process it down, chew it up, chew it down into something that gives you the juice, the inspirational methods. How does thread reflect light in a certain way? How can I group stitches together differently to get different textures? How can I use light to define different colors, even if I'm using the same color thread? What's the difference between full densities and light densities? And how can I use that to define um, value, color value, even using one color of thread or layering colors of thread? When we look at different kinds of embroidery, whether it's stuff that's exactly like what we want to do, or things that are further out away from what we want to do, we're always getting more information in our minds about what thread can do, what is possible with embroidery. And when we start thinking in that physical nature of what thread is and how it works, we're going to be able to make better decisions, I think, in general. Honestly, we'll know more about how things are put together conventionally because we're looking at, at work that is often like what we want to do. And then we can go on further and, and get inspiration to do things unconventionally to give us the edge sometimes over, over our competition and certainly to create things that are interesting and novel and inspire people and make them love that work. And when we're selling things, sometimes the edge really is for someone to see something and just go, wow, I haven't seen something like that before. And it's often where people build trust in your creative instincts is by seeing that you have the possibility to do something different, to do something more and to stand out. Um, there's always other things that come into it. The way they feel about your work and how much you care about what they do and what they need from you will always shine through. But when we're talking about digitizing the technical side of it, um, getting an inspiration and allowing ourselves to experiment, honestly, sometimes we'll even come up with ways. These, these things seem like a lot of manual labor and effort. They aren't always. A lot of these things can be done with the tools that we have. Uh, and by creative use of those tools. Just remember, uh, the tools are there to serve you. You're not there to serve the tools. Uh, don't let automation take away your creative impetus. Use those tools for what you want them to be. And know that uh, a stitch is a stitch is a stitch. They are all the only stitch that there is in machine embroidery put together in different configurations. And you get to choose how those are put together. So get out there, get some inspiration, take some time to play, and give yourself the space and grace to experiment, fail, but realize that any failure that leads to usable information isn't so much a failure as a learning experience. All right, folks, well, I'm going to get out there and experiment this coming week and do some learning myself. I suggest you do the same, but I can't wait to see you guys back here again with your questions, comments, and the things you discover next week. <laughs>